to thank everybody for uh, coming to our last meeting uh, on the John Mansfield uh, manufacturing plant, the uh, de demolition and so forth. Uh, this is a good opportunity to sit down and, and just go over uh, basically a debriefing meeting and to just go over some of the highlights of uh, the plus and, and negatives that we've learned on this project. I want to thank Dan Spear for, for being the state liaison, uh, coordinating with the state, Bonnie from the Neighborhood Task Force, and uh, Dennis from the uh, State Health Department, and uh, Mike working from the uh, local Board of Health point of view, handling all the calls and, and uh, trying to put the local fires out. Mike Buxton, the liaison to the uh, city and to the mayor's office, uh, coordinating all those efforts, uh, representing the Nash Nashville Fire Department. Look, maybe we could start with Mike, uh, if you'd like to just kind of give me your input on, on what you thought was one of the good positive aspects of why this thing worked. I, I think the team concept was the only route to go in the fire. Besides being an eyesore to the community, the former Johns Manville asbestos manufacturing plant posed a health threat to the region. Large quantities of asbestos-containing materials, or ACM, were present throughout the site. Over its 70 years, the plant switched hands several times, until being abandoned in 1992 and left to decay. Without a responsible owner to assume the burden of alleviating the threat, the cost was too much for the city of Nashua alone. In late 1994, the EPA responded to a request by the state to remove solvents and other materials under an emergency removal action. For this task, $500,000 was allocated. But the remarkable story of Johns Manville isn't in the danger that an abandoned asbestos site poses to a community or the technical approach taken to remove the threat, but rather the extraordinary degree of cooperation that existed between the various federal, state, and local agencies and the citizens of Nashua as they worked together to both raise and manage the millions of dollars needed to arrive at a safe and equitable resolution to the problem. A number of advantages for federal, state, local officials, and also the community to work together. Uh, the, the, the advantages and the potential benefits far outweigh any kind of detriments or any kind of extra work that, that might be involved in, in making a large group process. So, so I, I think it's something that everyone in, in the regulatory sphere should consider when they're looking at this type of situation. In fact, more and more agencies and residents alike are realizing that open communication between all players brings about positive results and often diffuses conflicts before they have a chance to flare up. In Nashua, the process began when neighbors first approached the city with concerns over diminished property values as a result of the obvious hazard that bordered their shops and homes. Several people in the neighborhood got together, the residents in the neighborhood, got together and tried to approach the city about what we could do to reduce this hazard because if the building collapsed under a snow load in the winter, uh, it could be a, quite a little cloud of asbestos dust left all around the place. The pretty much constant um, vandalism there and the fires, um, they were approached by um, the National Brownsfields projects and were invited to meetings to express their feelings about the site and its potential for redevelopment. And at the same time, they were also approaching their local officials about the health hazard um, and about really the blight to the neighborhood that this facility posed. The Neighborhood Task Force was formed almost upon request by city officials. Um, even though we live in this neighborhood and we were aware that the site was a problem, we had no idea that our involvement could be beneficial. And the city and the government made us aware of that in a, in a local town meeting in which we were asked to volunteer if we wanted to be part of the task force. Involving the community at Johns Manville was the right thing to do. People should have input into decisions that affect their lives. From the very beginning, the group began contributing. Together with the city, they approached agency after agency, including the regional EPA administrator and Congress, for support, funding, and a say in how things would proceed. One of the things we learned early on is that the community, the people that have the, the situation in their backyard, have to be involved in the decision-making process. And, and the state and federal folks from the health community were very helpful in educating them into the hazards and, and what they had to be concerned about and how we were going to engineer those hazards away during remediation. 
Well, I think it's a two-pronged approach. The first is to um, really find out where people are at with the whole project, with the whole site, to really um, talk to local residents, to offer them an opportunity to share their opinions and also their history with the site. There's a lot to be learned there. Um, and it can be really naive to come in and think that you can know everything about a site when you haven't lived near it. Um, so for both residents and local officials, it's important to really listen. Um, and to provide opportunities for people to tell what they know. And then the second piece of it is to really try to anticipate what people might want to know as the whole process goes along. Uh, you've, got to, you've got to invest a certain amount of time into your stakeholders in order to get something back from them. And, and in, on a long term and on a long run, uh, the project will go a lot smoother with, the, with your stakeholders and partners working with you. In January of 96, the roof on one of the buildings collapsed, and with it, the piping that contained a great deal of asbestos fiber. The City and Citizen Task Force again petitioned the EPA to help. Seeing the threat, the EPA appropriated another $500,000 to stabilize the situation. But this still fell far short of the community's hope to demolish the building and make the site suitable for future development. It became apparent to all parties that the necessary funding could not come just from one source. Rather, it needed to come from hands-on, hands-together approach. With a capable and engaged neighborhood organization already in place, the EPA, led by Paul Gruhl, encouraged the various city and state agencies to form a second, more powerful site task force, pooling resources and expertise to address the situation in the most efficient and economical way possible. Historically, community involvement has been limited to little more than the exchange of information about site activities, past and present. However, as part of the site task force, the public was invited to actively participate in the decision-making process, ensuring that future actions would be done with input from the people who had the most to gain or lose from its outcome. The task force came in with many suggestions, many different ideas, and, and, and basically uh, modified the work plan to the point that we did not follow the work plan and adhere to it as specified, but came across a lot of cost-saving and time-saving uh, uh, ideas that, that wouldn't have been utilized if we uh, worked as, as one person instead of as a team. The result was a well-coordinated team with a common goal. Locally, every city agency was involved to one degree or another, with Fire Chief Mike Buxton serving as the communications link. The EPA did a tremendous amount of planning and preparation and tried to anticipate problems. To his credit, on-scene coordinator Paul Gruhl treated people as professional colleagues with honesty and mutual respect. He was able to appreciate the concerns of all stakeholders and explained the evolving situation in language that could be understood by all. Quite frankly, the team effort here that was put on both at the federal level, the state level, and the local level is unheard of. And the cooperation, and I think you were here earlier for a task force meeting today that occurred, uh, the cooperation at all levels has been astronomical. From day one, um, the task force meetings were essentially open forums where, where all of the parties, including the local neighborhood groups and representatives of the city government, could come forward with their concerns and questions. This project would have taken a different course. Probably we would not have accomplished the things we did if we didn't have that close contact and that good working relationship with the people in the neighborhood in Nashua. It's been almost an honor to be part of the site meetings because it's information that we would have to read on paper and, and instead we're just we're welcome to attend and, and ask questions as we have them. But even with frequent communication to the community and the apparent degree of cooperation between site task force members, there were skeptics in the citizens task force that needed additional assurance. Our task force had a couple of members in the beginning that we needed to deal with that were um, approaching the project from a more negative standpoint and um, uh, basically I guess just to summarize they had a, a general mistrust of anything the government had its hands into and the way that we dealt with that rather than becoming derailed is um, 
if they had concerns about particular things that were being done or, or lack of information that they perceived coming from um, the city offices, we sent them to find that information so that they could find out for themselves that there's no cover-up or um, anything underhanded going on. And I think that helped to keep this um, a positive approach throughout the whole project. With all parties now on board, site task force members could focus their energies on managing the effort at hand and communicating progress to the residents of Nashua. They were very concerned about uh, public concern. Basically, uh, we were going to demolish a building completed, completely full with asbestos. Uh, the public health threat. Uh, Mike, did you receive very many phone calls uh, concerning the project? All the phone calls that I did receive uh, basically were saying how well the project was going and they enjoyed the uh, newsletters. Um, no negative responses. Uh, I did have a few phone calls as to um, you know, what was happening at the site and so forth. So I was able to uh, keep them abreast of what was going on as far as the project development. I had a lot of fun uh, working on that newsletter, and, and Dennis Pinsky, his department from the state of New Hampshire Department of Environmental and Health and Human Services, rather, uh, generated that newsletter on a, every two weeks. And uh, I want to commend Eileen for doing that. Maybe you may want to talk about that a little more, Dennis, on how uh, this whole newsletter evolved and so forth. Sure, Paul. One thing that was necessary, given the nature of this project and the involvement of all the agencies, um, it was crucial to keep the community informed of what was happening, when it was happening, uh, during the removal action. Early on, it was apparent to the site task force that they needed to keep as much of the community informed and involved as possible. So the New Hampshire State Department of Health and Human Services volunteered to generate a newsletter that would be made available to all. We've been involved with, with the community on several fronts here. We've had community meetings to, uh, to address public health concerns and community concerns about what's happening at the site. We've also produced a newsletter uh, in conjunction with uh, EPA and uh, also the Department of Environmental Services here in New Hampshire. Um, and it's been instrumental in uh, allaying a lot of public fears and concerns. It's improved our credibility and it's also uh, shown and demonstrated uh, that a partnership with the community and other agencies is, is not only feasible, it's really uh, a beneficial uh, approach to, to addressing uh, not only public health uh, matters, but also environmental uh, remediation and other activities. The Neighborhood Task Force had a meeting to discuss how the bulletin should be distributed and to whom. Um, we're in a very high traffic area of Nashua. We're one of the main corridors in, in and out of Nashua. And many people will stop on their way to work to a donut shop and pick up coffee and a donut or drop off their dry cleaning um, or have a... Um, a haircut on the way home and uh, we had very good response, very, very good response for, for people willing to put the flyers out, for people to pick up. Over 1,000 newsletters were printed every two weeks and then distributed by the Citizens Task Force. Apart from inviting residents to the regularly scheduled task force meetings, the newsletter also encouraged individuals to come to the site at any point in time to ask questions directly of on-scene coordinator Paul Gruel or other task force members. Shortly after the letters were distributed, community attendance at the regularly scheduled meetings began to fall off. Uh, once they came once or twice, uh, they, didn't, they didn't come back. And we were very concerned about that, so we started talking to people in, that were receiving our newsletter. And one of the things that the public uh, stated was that because of our open door policy, that they knew they could come to the trail at any time, that they felt there was no need to come on a, on a routine schedule. Community members and other agencies alike were regularly kept up to date with phone calls. Working hand in hand with on-scene coordinator Gruel, community involvement coordinator Liza Judge and others provided additional communication skills and expertise. Well, mainly we did a lot of talking. Um, we would share responding to calls from residents. Um, we tried to coordinate how residents' questions would get answered. Um, we tried to really have different um, entities who were interested in the site work together to come up with a communication strategy so that people knew where they could get information for health questions, where they could get information on how the demolition would be done, or where money could be found, um, or what was going to happen with re redevelopment afterwards. 
The 20-person site task force met over the span of one and a half years for well-managed hour-long meetings. The hard work that came out of these meetings resulted in some innovative recommendations, not only for how to clean up the site, but also more importantly, for how to allocate the available funds. So based on the dollars that we had, uh, we sat down with the city, the state, and all the other officials and, and, and local citizens and basically figured, okay, this is how much money we have, let's make the best, and let's get the biggest bang for our dollar. And that's what we're doing. And, uh, once a week, we sit down as a group and just decide how we're going to spend our money and which way is the best way to spend the money. And uh, talking about taxpayers getting a good bang for their dollar, this is it. This is the biggest bang they'll ever get. Whenever you're dealing with a, a project of this size, dollar-wise, the, the politicians are going to become involved because they, they want to make sure that the tax dollars are being spent wisely. And, and that's justifiable. But you have to justify how you're going to, to spend that money every step of the way. Consequently, by having the group that we built, the, the task force that we built, we were able to withstand the scrutiny of the, of the penny pinches, as I call them, uh, the people that count the beans. And the bean counters in the long haul were very satisfied with our progress. Dollar for dollar, I think their comment was, we stretched it to a dollar and a half. One of the biggest cost savers was the use of a national area landfill for the safe disposal of site materials. After some discussion with the state, the EPA got a sanction to bring the material to the local landfill. Together with other in-kind contributions by the city, namely police and fire support, the amount saved totaled well over $13 million. The site task force worked hard to make the community's recommendations work. For example, the initial work plan called for demolition and burial of waste on site. Instead, the task force found a way to remove everything and therefore not restrict the future use of the property. Again, nothing was done that wasn't in keeping with what the city wanted, from future use to day-to-day -day operations. And one of the things when we first started out, and in, in Dan Spear from the state of New Hampshire, is uh, I was just wondering, as the liaison to the state, you, you dealt with uh, numerous state agencies back in Concord. Uh, I just wondered how things evolved from that point of view. Paul, I think it was important that for people at Ground Zero, who were right in proximity to the project itself, to be able to give us information about their concerns so that we could put that in the work plan. And this is where the air monitoring plan came to be a very important tool in terms of satisfying the community's concerns and, and specifically, the, I felt, the task force people. The site task force plan called for a controlled demolition of the two buildings and the excavation and removal of all asbestos contaminated soils. The buildings were torn down using environmental controls and then dismantled while being sprayed with large amounts of water to prevent the release of asbestos fibers into the air. To ensure that the plan was working, air monitoring stations were installed throughout the site and in the adjoining neighborhoods. Every day, the EPA's environmental response team in association with the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services tested the air and shared the results with the task force and the community. Representing the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services, Dennis Pinsky was in a watchdog role. As a partner, his agency had to concur with all activities and ensure that no release occurred. As a representative of the State Health Department, our focus was on public health issues uh, associated with any removal action or any kind of adverse any kind of adverse event at the site that, that might occur before the removal. Specifically, our concern during the removal activity was to, was to ensure that there were no off-site releases of asbestos material. Relative to that, we worked very closely with EPA's technical staff in developing an air sampling plan. Uh, the, there was an operation from day one of the removal activities through the completion of the project. We evaluated the daily air sampling data and that and what the data showed at the conclusion of the project was that there were no significant off-site releases in other words the community was not put at risk from the activities that EPA and the contractors did relative to cleanup of the site in comparison to the other sites what stands out of the Johns Manville site is the way in which all stakeholders were able to align their goals and work together to achieve them 
the cooperative spirit that was fostered between the community and the site task force spread to positively affect the way the participating agencies interacted. Traditional approaches were streamlined to work more efficiently and ultimately shorten the project schedule. Not only had the Johns Manville site become one of the most successful in all of New England, but the effort revitalized the neighborhood, improving property values. It was really approached that everyone had something to share, be it money, be it advice, be it resources, um, that everyone could contribute something. And so the task force worked well because problems were evaluated together, and then people would offer um, what they could contribute to resolving problems or, or looking at um, what was coming up next. Well, as, as a group, the task force made the critical decisions that needed to be made based on the, the level of funding we had at the time. It needs to be plainly understood that, that this particular abatement did not happen in one funding mechanism. It happened over several funding mechanisms and in pieces, actually. And it wasn't until the last piece of the puzzle was in place that we were assured that we were going to have a completed goal. Based on what we've been told about uh, cleanup sites around the country, we feel, um, we feel that somehow we have really got very lucky in this situation because the on-site coordinator, Paul Gru, has been wonderful. They've been, they've been um, telling us uh, every step of the way what's going to happen next, what to, in, what to expect. Um, the air monitoring has been explained to us. It's been a very good experience for us. Well, in summary, I, I think this debriefing went very well. Uh, I really want to thank everybody working together. It's, it's, it's not EPA, it, it's not the city or the state or, or the neighborhood task force, but all of us working together. It's people working together. I, I think the tree symbolizes uh, a new vitality, a new right, revitalization for the community. It all goes back to the community and the, the people behind it. It's the people involved, and it's all about people. And that's what uh, the neighborhood should really remember.